very warm welcome to everyone. So um, let's get started. I think we have a few more people coming in, but let's start because we have such an active program. My name is Pari Namazi. I am a, a managing partner at UNEPA and UNEPA runs Vienna Global Leaders. It's a global leadership community. It's dedicated to connecting, developing and inspiring leaders. Uh, what we do is really bring together leaders and experts to discuss topics on leadership, talk about best practices, what our challenges are, and also share some big picture thinking. We have various programs, we have insights, and we have the Vienna Global Leaders Forum. Uh, and uh, it's in the past year, in 2021, we've had three, this is our third forum, and we'll have one more to close the year. And uh, when we close the year, we'll come back to you and get some feedback from you, uh, what we need to do, what you'd like to hear more from Vienna Global Leaders about. Um, and really exciting about our speakers and about our topic on young leaders, why this topic? Uh, I mean, part of the research that we're seeing is that, of course, more and more millennials and Gen Z are coming into the workforce. How to manage and motivate them is slightly different. They are a, a talent workforce who is looking more at purpose at work, career opportunities, flexible working. And um, what we find as well, especially since the pandemic, is that research shows that one in three millennials might quit their jobs after the pandemic. And part of that is because of pressure of work, of not having the career opportunities and career, career development opportunities they wanted. So partly it's looking at what do we do to engage with this workforce? What do we as organizations need to do to rethink our talent strategy? And to this aim, we have a wonderful panel of experts today. And we've really tried to keep diverse perspectives here. So we have Claudia Barona Padovani from DHL Express Europe. Claudia joins us as our young leader. anne Katrin Kakor comes from Danfoss. And anne Katrin comes with uh, well, each of them will share a little bit of their bio. Danfoss, she comes with Danfoss, which is an established organization. So we're going to look and, and ask her about what is it about um, Danfoss, a large organization? How do you attract this young talent? And Andrew Mina joins us from Illumi, and Illumi is a startup. So we're looking at, you know, what does a startup do? So without further ado, I would like to jump to our speakers and, and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. And with that, I hand over to Claudia. Claudia, very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Pari. And I'm very excited to uh, be here. And to be honest, very excited to see some familiar names uh, in the uh, panelists and then the guest list. So thanks very much, everybody, for uh, joining. So like uh, Pari said, my name is Claudia Barona Padovani. Uh, very long name, but very Latin. I am originally from Ecuador um, and I'm currently the head of talent acquisition, talent management and engagement for DHL Express um, Europe. And Pari asked us to share a little fun fact uh, about ourselves. And I thought, okay, what can I share that it's funny? And I thought, okay, something that I do and uh, something funny that I do is that I only buy bananas that come from Ecuador. So every time I go to the supermarket, I have a big challenge finding these bananas that, you know, I have to support my own country. So I thought I'll share this funny fact um, with you all today. So thanks again for joining and looking forward for a great conversation. Claudia, thank you. That, that is a fun fact. Uh, next time I buy bananas, I'll be checking where they're coming from. And of course, we have to say congratulations to DHL Express for becoming Europe's best workplace. Really big, big congratulations. Maybe in, when you have your, when you're giving some insight, further insight, you can share a little bit about that too. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Pleasure to have you with us. I would love to hand over to Anne Katrin. And uh, Anne Katrin, maybe you have a few words to introduce yourself and also share a fun fact about you. I will. Thank you, Pari. Um, yeah, my name is Anne Katrin Kakur. Uh, I currently work for Danfoss. I've been with the company for one and a half years. So it means I will also share a bit of my experience from previous uh, roles I've had. 
Um, I am responsible for uh, HR systems uh, data uh, services. Uh, it's a global global role, global function, and I have uh, worked most of my career in in similar uh, positions. Uh, also driving a lot of HR transformation and changing operating models. I am a leader of leaders, um, so I, I do uh, have quite some experience directly myself also to how it is to to, to lead uh, different uh, gener uh, generations. Um, uh, but I can also obviously also share what I see happening in the company. Um, I have a big passion for coaching, uh, developing people. Um, yeah, located in Germany, uh, work globally, remotely, uh, everywhere. I'm originally from Finland. Fun fact, um, I uh, I don't have a funny fact, but something that was fun for me. Um, so although I've been working in HR most of my career, I started off in a completely other area. And most people probably don't know that. Um, I uh, worked for a cultural institute in Belgium and arranged uh, events like jazz concerts and um, uh, uh, organizing art exhibitions and did everything from A to Z, uh, serving the drinks and packing the paintings, <laughs> writing the, the programs. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And you never know where you end up uh, during your career. So, so true. Yeah, so I'm really excited to be here as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here. And yeah, it's amazing what you said about you never know where you end up on your career. It takes us through so many paths. And I think every encounter and every experience adds to get us to where we are now, right? Indeed. Thank you for being with us. And finally, last but not least, Andrew, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very you much. Tell us a bit about yourself. Thanks, Pari. What an amazing uh, company of people I get to be a part of this afternoon's conversation with. So I, like many of the guests, are really looking forward to hearing from anne Katrine and from Claudia. But hello, everyone. My name is Andrew. I am an Australian based in Copenhagen, thus the Copenhagen background behind me of Newhound. I'm the People and Customer Experience Manager for Alumi, which is a HR software firm that started up in Copenhagen just around six years ago. And we look at how we combine performance and learning together with our platform. So look, after nearly two years, uh, so nearly 20 years working in HR and L&D, it's exciting to see what's happened and what's changed and what has stayed the same. And I think we'll hear a bit about that today, about some of the things that we keep doing because they work and some of those things we're doing new because of the new generations. But um, it is a real privilege to be here and to be on here on behalf of Illumi. So the super fun fact, and, I, and I'm and i sorry to say, I have so many, I really had to narrow it down. But when I was a teenager growing up in Australia, I lived on a farm and I actually lived on an emu farm. And if you know anything about Australia, emus are a flightless bird native to Australia. That is definitely beats the fun facts. Who, who would have that living on an emu farm? Very cool, very cool, Andrew. Thank you all for being here. You know, I realize I'm so hopeless that I never ever introduce myself. <laughs> so I'm going to do a short introduction to myself as well for people who do not know me, apart from being Pari Namazi. I'm an executive coach, a leadership facilitator, also with a long background in HR for quite a few years. And I leave it at that, but my fun fact is I love tap dancing. And I have been tap dancing for at least three years, and I'm the worst tap dancer in my class and probably in all of Austria, but I'm dead stubborn, so I keep going to tap dance all the time. So if you guys come on a Tuesday afternoon, you can join me tap dancing in Vienna face to face now instead of virtual much more fun. <laughs> so with that let's start. And what, we, what we'd like to do is um, invite you to listen to some of these insights from Claudia and Anne Katrin and Andrew. And please, uh, what we'll do is let them take their, uh, have a discuss, you know, share their insights. Please, any question you have, if you could write it in the chat box, we'd welcome that. And um, we'd like to start with each of the speakers. We'll give you a poll question to get some feedback from you. And so we'd like to start on our first poll question before we hand over to Claudia. 
So the question is, what, in your opinion, would motivate a millennial? Choose your top three. Is it salary? Is it flexible work? Is it a good boss? Is it a cool title? Is it a nice place to work? Is it learning and growth opportunities, purpose and vision of company, culture, and an inclusive workplace? So let's uh, wait for people to respond. Yeah, what would motivate a millennial? We're seeing learning and growth opportunities as our number one factor. That, that is what motivates millennials. And the second factor is flexible work. Um, and the third one we're looking at is purpose and vision of the company. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. So 72% would be learning and growth opportunities, 53 is flexible work, and 44% uh, is purpose and vision. A little lower on that list, 36% would be culture and inclusive workplace, and slightly lower than that would be salary. And that's actually what we're seeing as the research as well. So a lot of the research so shows is that salary is not the number one motivating factor. It is very much about learning and growth. It is about purpose and vision, um, about having flexible work. These are important things. A cool title, not that appealing to our millennials. Really interesting. Um, so, so thank you for responding to that poll. And with that, I'd like to go to um, Claudia. And Claudia, maybe you as a young leader and as a millennial, ask your opinion on what, in your opinion, attracts and excites millennials and Generation Z. Um, is it the environment? Is it leader? What do you think about these poll questions? What, what's, your, what's your insight on that? And we'd love you, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and we'd love you not only to share uh, it from a millennial's perspective, but also your own perspective of what motivated you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for the question, uh, Pari. And I think, you know, this is a bit easier for me to answer as a millennial, uh, like you said, myself. And um, I think it's not one thing, uh, it's really a combination of things. And um, there is two elements to think, right? So what really attracts um, our generation? So millennials, Gen Z. And I think, you know, we are humans at the end of the day. So it's not like it's something different to the other generations, but we do have access to a lot more information. So information, it's at our fingertips. And I think that's why we look more uh, of what really attracts us to this company. So when I try to divide the two topics and I said, as a millennial, what really attracts um, this young leader generation to a different companies? I think really the brand, the different brand uh, perception from outside. So how are they perceived um, in this millennial's eyes? So what are these companies doing, right? So I think everybody, I can quickly uh, Google them. They look for their LinkedIn pages and then they check, is this company a place where I would like to work? Do they match my own values? Are they doing something for the society? Are they contributing um, to our world? So I think um, when a company has a very strong uh, brand presence and this relates uh, to their uh, potential uh, new employees, uh, there is a big attraction in that um, sense but i think something that also works very well is when they can relate to other people working there so when there's a lot of storytelling right so other young employees other young leaders sharing uh, their stories and sharing that they made a good career there that they are supported that uh, you know their mission and the purpose of that company is real it's not only one line in their website but is really something that they live uh, every single day. So I think those are the things that attract people. Um, another aspect which I think is important is when companies are very much, um, you know, linked or they uh, have good interaction with student organizations, with young professional organizations, because like that, they build that relation from the beginning and they make it clear that they support the generations, that they are there because, you know, they are interested on learning from them on the way they do things and that they will welcome them to their organization. So I think that's another very important aspect when it comes to attracting millennials. But definitely one thing is attracting them. And I think it is a challenge. But once you have them 
with your organization. Retaining them is a big challenge that we are facing. Um, and I think when it comes to retaining people, uh, one of the very important aspects, at least from uh, my point of view, is the culture of the company. So there are things that need to be in place and you need to feel that this culture uh, fits and matches you know, who you are. So the culture, the values um, is very important for these generations. Um, I know in the poll we had a question on bo bosses, your manager. I do think leaders uh, in general, um, the managers of these young uh, leaders play a key role because they could create the supportive environment. They could be the ones um, empowering them, giving these um, young leaders the possibility to have a voice, to raise their um, ideas. and at the same time know that they will have somebody holding their backs. So I think they do mm. play a big role uh, in these companies. Um, I think the visibility, like I said, right, as in even if you're young, if you have a company that no matter how young, how inexperienced or experienced you are, they give you that visibility, that give you that space to grow. They support in your learning and your development. That's also very important. And now with the new ways of working, right, this flexibility, the fact that we can work remotely, that we can um, be more flexible uh, with our life and have a bit more focus on our life work balance. I think that's another very important aspect. Um, another thing maybe that I could think of is digitalization. So of course, we live in a digital era and I think it's something that you look for. Maybe it's not important for everybody, but depending on your role, I think that's something that um, could be a uh, key for these millennials. And I think I just reflect back a little bit on my own career, right? And the fact that I always uh, call myself a digital baby and the fact that I fell in love with this company and I still um, stay there is because I joined as a young intern. So I was very active um, with ISEC, so a student organization when I was at university. And DHL, so the DP DHL uh, group was our one of their biggest partners. And, you know, I always thought, such a supportive company, they will come to our conferences. So the brand was always in my mind. And when I found a great opportunity, I said, I'm going to take it. And they really didn't disappoint me because the minute I entered the company, um, you know, they were so supportive that I, from day one, I, you know, I was treated like, you know, a normal employee, you have a voice, if you have an idea, put it there, we will support you. I had very great leaders who always, you know, hold my back and said, yeah, Claudia, go ahead, you know, I'll support you that. So I think that really worked for me. So having that culture, that environment that helped me grow, um, you know, when I wanted to apply for a new role, I always had leaders that guide me. So that was very important for me. And at the end of the day, there were things like uh, programs that the company has um, that contribute to the society uh, engagement programs that, you know, will just make work not only work, but work fun every day. So I will, uh, you know, have a best day every day um, were the things that worked for me. And at the end, the company became a little bit like my yellow family, like we like to call it. So I think that was, those are some of the things that are important uh, for this generation, in my opinion and that um, companies should be focusing on because very clearly so pay is important and I think fair pay is important, but it's not um, the thing that drives these generations to go to one company or the other. Yeah, Claudia, lovely, lovely. Thank you for that. And I, I'd i like to challenge you on something, not challenge, I'd like to ask you something because you highlighted some really nice points when you talked about a millennial, what are you looking for? What is a millennial looking for? And the points you raised was the brand perception. And you talked about relating to other people. So it's not lip service in the organization. You talked about the interaction with other associations and like being a bigger, bigger picture over there and how important the culture was and leaders to actually inspire and help um, young people grow and uh, have their back. And then you talked about the flexibility and digitalization. What for you was the most important factor in your development within DHL? What inspired you? Yeah, <laughs> very hard to pick, Fari, but I think uh, for me uh, was definitely um, the leadership culture. So yeah. uh, that 
you know, feeling that in this company, uh, I was supported, I mm. was empowered. So that was really key for me. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate that answer because uh, um, you, you know this, I've been doing some work on um, leaders in transition and a lot of the stories from different ages of leaders all come back to a good boss, a good leader, someone who inspired me, someone who helped me grow. So it's, it's a, a lovely story that you share. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will, we'll come back uh, and ask you another question, but I'd like to sure. move on to anne Catherine. And anne Catherine, um, before we, we in, engage in a question with you, um, we have a poll question to look at. And this poll question looks at, um, sorry, and before I move to that, if you have any questions for Claudia, please put it in the chat box. We'll come back to that uh, when we have our Q&A session after we finish Andrew's question, then we'll, we'll do a Q&A session together. Um, the, the poll question to ask our participants is what is harder from the employer's perspective? Is it harder to attract talent? Is it harder to retain young talent? In your opinion, are they both equally hard or none of them? We have it all figured out. What, in your opinion, is from the employer's perspective, what is harder? Yeah, really, really nice. So most of you are saying both are equally hard. I love that no one said none of them that we have it figured out because I mean, that would be, why would we be here, right? Um, both are equally hard. And then the second answer, the second, um, the, the second factor was retaining young talent is harder than attracting them. So it seems to be easy to attract them, but how do we keep hold of that young talent is the challenge. And um, thank you everyone for, for the poll. Um, that was great, thank you. Uh, what I'd love to move towards anne Katrine and ask you anne Katrine is um, within, within a large structured organization, um, how do you attract and retain young talent? What, what are the challenges that you faced? And, and I know what would be lovely is, and I know what you'll share as well is, um, you know, it's, it's the successes, but it's also the challenges and failures perhaps, what worked, what didn't work. We'd love to hear that from you. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, interesting also to see the poll and I, um, yeah, on one hand happy that no one has figured it out, but it would be nice if someone had figured it out. <laughs> So we could learn from it. And I must say, in my experience, uh, um, it, it seems to be slightly more difficult to retain than to attract, although it is also hard to, to, to attract. What I have experienced, though, is um, depending, depending on the industry or the company, <clears throat> when I look at the, the, uh, the multi national companies I've, I've worked for. Obviously, if you have a product that's very close to end consumer, it's an attractive brand driven uh, as, as it's been in, in, during my career, it was very easy to attract uh, people to come regardless of, uh, of age or uh, where they were in the career. And now working for an engineering company uh, where the products are maybe not that known or maybe not that exciting to an, a, a normal regular uh, end consumer uh, equal to an applicant, uh, it is a little bit harder. Uh, and sometimes it's very much harder uh, because the, the, the company or the brand might not be known. So I think that's something that we're definitely looking into uh, because we have a very appealing um, uh, message or an appealing uh, purpose that we can uh, put more emphasis to, um, be, be much more clearer in that message and, and really drive and um, evolve the employer value proposition. Uh, I think what's sometimes hard uh, as well is um, who do you target? So uh, it's okay to say, what do we need today? And what are the capabilities? What are the roles we need today? But what do we need tomorrow? And uh, how can we start planning a little bit more long term, a little bit more strategically, so that we can, on one hand, make sure that we attract the target, uh, the right type of skills, uh, 
the right type of capabilities, but also use that as an opportunity to show uh, what is possible. Where can you go in this company? Uh, how can you develop? We saw that in the in the. Uh, um, earlier Paul as well that learning and growth was so important learning and growth yeah but for what and to what and which areas and I think uh, um, currently many companies uh, ours including struggles a little bit with that to say okay but yeah we, we know what's happening uh, big trends uh, we, we, we know our business but how do we take time and how do we how do we really make some structured uh, decisions towards uh, what, what it is uh, um, more mid to long term. So that's uh, one thing I wanted to um, to highlight. What I've seen also, um, I know um, compensation was one that was not coming up uh, much. I, I must say I have noticed myself being a hiring manager the last year or two. That's definitely a <laughs> topic. There's no doubt about it. Um, maybe for a more specialized uh, position could be, uh, but I think it's been a very, it's a very, very fast recruiting um, environment. You need to be really, really fast. Uh, I think uh, especially millennials know very well, very well in articulating what they want, what they need, what they demand. And it's absolutely no um, a problem for them to say like, okay, you know what? Yeah, I would like to do it, but I, 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 I demand more. Um, I, this is on top of it. And um, that brings me to another aspect that was uh, um, surprising that uh, the, the boss and the leadership was not uh, mentioned that much. And my experience is that the role of the leader makes a huge difference, especially to retain people and make them stay, but also to um, to, to to get people to grow and uh, be promoters uh, for them. And I think the leadership style is something that we do need to pay attention to. I know that we have in our company um, very senior leaders who have worked very hard and long years to get where they are. And it's sometimes difficult to accept that you have younger people coming in and say, well, I can do that job in two years uh, <laughs> because it comes across as arrogant. It comes across as, well, he, he like, what, what do you know about this? But actually, I think some of them do. <laughs> they, they are well educated. They have other ways of um, picking up learning uh, and, and a, a huge drive. And if I may, I, should, I, I would like to share a, converse, a little bit about a conversation I had with my son, who is a teenager. So even younger than the millennials. And, and I asked him what he expect from a leader. Uh, when he would, if he would uh, enter the workplace in a, go to a company tomorrow, what would he expect from a leader? And he was very clear with what a leader is. And for he is, it's no discussion. He would work in a team, a group of people. They would all come in with their individual, unique strengths, capabilities. And then they would look amongst them. Who of us is the most suitable to be the leader of the group, or rather to be the coordinator of the group and the coordinator of the deliverables. And I know, yes, there are companies out there where, where you can have this already, but certainly not the majority and certainly not in the, um, in, in the more, uh, the bigger corporate world. Uh, it, it's not that common to have that. But this is someone who is in a generation that they have all, already started to enter the, the, the workplace and in less than 10 years it will be many of them and they look at uh, leadership and the role of a leader completely different to what we have now in some of the, the, the senior segments so that is definitely a, some tensions uh, and, and um, we, we look also into how to coach how to um, help um, senior leaders to understand and to accept some of uh, of this behavior, some of understanding this uh, um, these ex expectations um, that that uh, other generations have. And Katrin, that was lovely. I mean, thank you for that. What what I heard from your sharing your insights was a little bit of how we have to redesign our talent strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little, you know, the points that you mentioned, it's, I, I loved how you started with the brand because 
if you are a known company, that's one thing. But if you're not, you have to work so much harder on that to how do you sell yourself? And it's, it is about the culture. And how do you get someone, a young person to come in and really get that sense of what your organization is about? And you're absolutely right. It is all about career path development. What are they going to get? How are they going to develop over there? And I agree 100% in you. I think millennials are very clear on what they want. They know what they want. And mm -hmm. they know what they don't want. And, and, and I love how they are so uh, clear on negotiating that. And also um, leadership. I think what, you're, you're, what you um, referred to is that we really have to re-examine our leadership. Because if you want to attract these millennials, we're going to have to do it in a different way. So, so really nice. Can I ask you, um, in your experience, what may, maybe just to share something from from your uh, company experience, can you give us one one thing that didn't work well? In uh, attracting or retaining? Yeah, yeah, it didn't so, it didn't have the impact. Didn't work that well. Uh, so one thing that I can admit that we are not good at and therefore not using the opportunities that are there is to look, um, or maybe two things, but first of all, to, to look at why people are leaving. There's some really easy ways in a structured, uh, technology supported way to, to, to gather and capture some of those insights and then also to do something about it. Uh, and I think that is um, certainly one areas that, 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 we, that we need to focus on. We need to do something about it uh, because I think we have good ideas of what we can do to drive the attraction, to um, get much more uh, clear about what we offer and uh, um, what, what a solid and, uh, and future-proof um, industry uh, we're working in. Uh, but it is how to keep the people and if they are leaving to be very, very un, uh, have a uh, to dare to understand uh, why it is uh, so and then to do something about it. And that that certainly is still a struggle. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Anne Katrin, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. We will uh, come back to you in a minute, but and I know we already have in the chat box some questions coming up. If you have a minute, um, have a look at them while I have this uh, little chat with Andrew and I get Andrew to share his insight. And again, Andrew is coming from a startup culture. So we'd like to ask the third question, our poll question, which is actually asking you, our participants, who would you prefer working for? Would you prefer to work for a startup, an established organization, a top 500 company or yourself? Hmm, interesting. Very, very interesting. So what we're seeing in the results is it looks like, well, we have we don't have a 52% have participated. Is it a little difficult to answer? Um, just go for it. Just put your, your finger on the number. Um, but what we are seeing over here is more of you would like to go with the top 500 organization yourself. Really interesting. And um, established organization a little less and a startup would be the lowest mm -hmm. percentage here very very interesting so let's let's ask andrew this question now <laughs> so thank you for sharing that uh, the feedback on the poll and um the question i'd like to ask you andrew is coming from a startup how do startups and small companies compete for talent I mean, we're just seeing right here in the answer to this question is that not many people want to work for a startup. And let's hear it from you. Why, how, how, how do you compete for talent and what encourages your talent to stay on and grow? Yeah, it's a, it's a privilege to be here. And I, I'm sure like others, you've got lots out of what um, Claudia and Anne Katrina have already said. So I just really hope to bring some more of the conversation. What I would love to know from this poll, Pari, is which generation answered which question? <laughs> because a good I'm question. sure in different parts of your life, you'd be like, oh yeah, a startup, no worries. I'll throw caution to the wind. Who cares about pension? I don't want to buy a house yet. Of course I'll do a startup. 
But then there's others in certain parts of their life, like I need an established organization, I want pension, I want to know this, I want a surety, I want that. And maybe uh, for those people who've gone for themselves, it's they're in that part of their career where they've already established themselves, they know their skills, their talents, and they're like, I much be, uh, prefer to be able to coordinate my day, coordinate when I do stuff, instead of going on holidays when everyone else is on holidays, I can go when I want to go. So there's, I have lots of questions about the question that we have in front of us. But when it comes down to actually competing for talent, there, there are so many factors. And in the startup world, especially you take the city like Copenhagen, we are a SaaS hub. There are so many startups and so many SaaS companies here. And we're all doing something different, but we all have the same demand. We're all looking for the next round of talent. We're looking for the next round of people to come and join our organizations to bring their best to who we are. But what it helps is, is, do you know who you are as a business? Do you know your industry? Do you know the workspace you're in? Because if you're not really sure <clears throat> of who you are and what you're trying to achieve, if you haven't worked that out as a startup, you don't know who to attract. You don't know who you're competing against. So I think as a, as a startup is able to really define what is their purpose and mission, what problem they're trying to solve, then it makes easier for them to go out and say, that's the talent I need. That's the person I need to bring in the business, opposed to going, I'll take anyone. And, you know, a lot of startups will take, will do that. They'll just bring in everyone and have high turnover. And you'll see a lot of people with these one year, six months, year and a half on their, on their salaries, because they took an opportunity in a startup thinking this could be it. But on the flip side of that, the startup's going, I think you could be it, but not really knowing themselves well enough. The other thing is about, and this was mentioned earlier, is about what talent do I need today, next month, next year, and going forward, you know, especially if you've just got a fresh round of investors, you know, dropping the millions into your bank account, what have they said that you want? So how do you then go back and find the right people to match your business strategy in the short and the long term? And one of the things that startups need to think about, and I got this illustration from reading a book about the Volvo World Ocean Race is that they had crews on ships that only did certain segments of the journey. So you may have sailed from London to South Africa. You may have sailed from South Africa to Sydney, but you didn't go Sydney to New Zealand or New Zealand to the South Tip of South America. Teams and startups naturally change based on the journey of the startup. So you may have come in at this point, but the organization has now grown beyond that person. So now we need to find out how do we know who we are to attract the next person to join the team to go to the next leg of the race. And that's where competing for talent can be really hard because you're competing against yourself. Because on one side, you're trying to develop the talent you have, but on the other side, you're needing talent at a certain point to get to the next segment of the race. Um, but ultimately, you've got to grow the business. You can't stay in startup mode forever. You've got to go from startup to scale up to, you know, eventually maybe top 500, a unicorn, who knows? But the point is, you've got to know you can't stay where you are. So your business is going to grow, your people need to grow, and maybe you need to attract, attract new talent for that next part. But the other thing is this personalization of the workforce. And you've got to, you know, you may put a job out saying, I need an SEO specialist. And yes, you do. But what if someone like Claudia comes to your team and she's got SEO, but maybe she's also got something else and something else. So maybe you've brought her in initially for that, but you realize from talking to her, actually, she would be amazing if we took that SEO role and added this to it, because we're going to get something we never expected. Or maybe Anne Katrine comes and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize someone was in the marketplace with that talent and you found it in there and you're like, okay, Anne Katrine, come and do this job because it's best for you and it'll take the business to next year. So we can't just do things very linearly. We have to do that personalization of the job roles according to the talent we find. And as mentioned, bringing the talent in, we're competing against culture and value. Is your company carbon neutral? Is your company got strong CSR? Do you have plant-based lunches? Okay, for those of you playing at home, vegan lunches, I, I have to say it. Are you delivering on, you know, we have, you know, a zero travel policy? What are those things? Those things are going to bring the, the, the next round of talent to your business because they're going to go, as we've heard, I identify with that. I want to be a part of an organization which is neutral, which is making it better for the world around them.
Mm. And then we go in, we go into that workplace experience. So when someone's coming, you want to say, hey, we've got really great workplace experience. Don't you, Claudia? Yes, we know. We can see it behind you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but what is your workplace experience like? You know, is it is it about the foosball tables? Is it about the free coffee, the beers on a Friday? You know, you need to understand what is it that they're looking for. And But in all of this, we have to still remember that this purpose and belonging is a kicker. It really just stays there. And we saw that with 44% in the first poll. If your business doesn't have a good purpose and vision, people aren't going to sign on because working for a startup, it can be hard sometimes because everything's not laid out for you. You don't have a perfect policy on this. You don't have a guide on that. You, you know, maybe you work more hours in the day because you're really trying to achieve something. So bringing and, and attracting talent to your business, it is a competition and businesses have to work hard at this, knowing about who they are, what are they trying to achieve and what can they offer employees. But in all of that, if you can do that, you're going to have those clear experiences and clear expectations for everybody. And we heard before, it's the networking, it's the career pages, uh, it's Instagram. So at Illumi, we use Instagram only to talk about employment experience. Like what's it like to work at Illumi? All the product stuff can go to Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, but what is it like to look like an Illuminizer? And we have to be digital first and sharing that information and also bringing in that referral program. So at Illumi, we have a referral program. That if you nominate somebody and they get the job and they stay for a period of time, you'll get a cash bonus. And many companies do that. But also on the cash there, it also comes down to with startups, are you prepared to take lower salary to get equity in the business, knowing that it's going to grow and achieve my great things? So maybe I will take that lower salary. I won't take pension or I won't take leave or I won't take this because I know there's something bigger ahead. There's something I can achieve more. So I think they're all the big topics that people are thinking about in the startup world in terms of competing for talent in no matter where you're located. And now, of course, we can work from home. We can work from anywhere. Now you're not competing just in your town or your city or state or region. You really are competing globally to get the talent you want for your business. <clears throat> and now you've got them, which is amazing. Well done. You found the right team. But now you actually have to get them to stay and to grow. We can't just leave them as we found them. We've got to help them find their voice. And the thing is that you find in startup companies, there's a lot more space for the uh, value for the individual contributor, contribu contrib contribution. I got there. <laughs> you got, there's a lot more space. For that. There's a lot more space for voices to be heard because the mm. distance between you and the CEO, the distance between you and the VP of this or that, it's not that far. And maybe you're sitting at the same table as them. So it's about actually making sure that, you know, people's voices are heard and it's the recognition. That's what helps people stay in stars. I'm recognizing you. I recognize the role that you're playing. I recognize that you've contributed this. I recognize that you did a bit of extra hard work. And that's also a lot easier. And at Lumi, we have a whole bunch of fun awards we give out periodically around the year just to recognize people. So it's not about the money, but it's about them, their contribution, their voice, their, what they've brought to the business. And I think also when we're doing this, we've got to remember that the workforce is changing, but people also are happy to stay in the workforce in a startup. I think if they do find generations, I know at Illumi, we are something like 70% Gen Z. I mean, it's crazy. But the or Gen, and Gen X is right up there as well. But the point is that people also love to have a generational workplace where they can hear and learn from people. And maybe it's coaching or mentoring in a facilitated way, but it's also just the environment where we're working collaborative together and there's a lot more barriers broken down. Healthy management, yes. That keeps people staying, you know, that manager who pushes you to take a course, who encourages you to do something else. But also it's thinking about how do we have in a, in a startup which you don't have in other things, it's like, it's a lot more human. There's a lot more interactivity. There's not so many layers. This keeps people here. What also keeps people here is a lack of bureaucracy. There really isn't a lot of bureaucracy in a startup. And maybe they may go through a season where they're like, okay, you can only have one can of Coke in the morning and one in the afternoon and no more. And other times they're like, help yourself. And other times we also want to look at how we can just adopt a more flexible approach because as a startup, we are more flexible. We're not beholden to so many other things. 
And then the other things we're looking at is this learning and development. We've got to understand how do we provide an amazing pre-boarding and onboarding experience that gives people the real boost to productivity in their new job. They don't spend as much time wondering about how can I find my space? How can I bring, bring my contribution to the purpose? But they can get in. And then to say, you've come in here, but how can we help you grow? Is it um, an, a library of e-learning? Is it, you know, you know, one-to-ones with a manager? What is it that we can help them grow? And we're going to be really conscious about that. And I just want to comment on one thing is that, and it was mentioned before, we have to bring people in at a point where we say, we recognize the role you're playing today. Sorry, guys. Andrew, what happened to you? We lost you. Yes, it, it's a funny story. So I work in a blue <laughs> building and my lights are on sensors and I was not being active enough and the lights went out. <laughs> so I work in a green building. Um, but we have to remember, we've got to develop people for their role today. What yeah. skills do they need today? Not their strengths. We need to support their strengths. But what skills do they need for today? What skills do they need to get them to their next role? Yeah. And then how can we help promote them and grow them to the next role, which may be outside of their organization? So it's really much about looking at the whole person and getting them to have the best experience in your organization now, but recognizing there may become a time where they go to the next one. So how can you help them continue on a path of growth that they become an ambassador for your business when they move on to the next organization? Say, hey, I did one, two, three years but they loved me, they grew me, they developed me, and now I'm doing this, you should find them a great team to work with as well. So there's some of my things that I'd want to say on, you know, competing for your, your talent and how to keep them to stay and grow. And, and thank you, Andrew, because there was such a lot of stuff you did share in there. And I love the, the different perspectives that we had. This was so powerful hearing it from Claudia's perspective and Anne Katrin and, and from you, Andrew. And um, there are a lot of questions uh, I, I, I know we're a little short on time, so I'm going to push you to say this quickly. Um, and then people have asked questions and there's some comments, so I'm going to come and read that. But Andrew, just maybe if you share, where did you fail as a startup? What did you not get right? What we didn't get right was actually a talent development program. And we went too formal, too hard we weren't able to see that we needed a much more flexible approach to developing our next generation of leaders and helping them grow into becoming who we think they could be. And so we've actually at the moment ripped that apart and rebuilding something brand new at the moment. And I, I get to be a part of that team to see what can we do to help you lead people better, especially with the young leaders that are often first time leaders. So how do we help them be able to have those tough conversations? How do we help them to know how to give feedback? How can we help them to be able to promote learning and development in the midst of their own learning and development? Mm, nice. Thank you, Andrew. So let me uh, first here, thank you to all three of you. I'm just going to go through our chat. We have some questions over there. Um, I'll, I'll just read some of the comments and then go to the questions. Um, Right, so some of the comments was um, just Ahmed says, I think each organization has its own culture. The millennials are offered are designed based on the type of person they need to attract the, the organization, absolutely, regardless the age. And Mohammed says, millennials talk with each other. They have access to information way more easier than previous generation. Leadership should manage these trends within the organization to establish the right field of play for millennials and even the latest generation. Um, you got some feedback about generation Gen Z, definitely startup culture. <laughs> so that, that sort of, I think that response came back um, to your question, Andrew. And then some of the questions we have over here, Megla asks a question to anne Katrin, but to everyone, what can companies do to ensure the buy-in from millennials on why they do what they are asked to do, especially when they're working in a cross-generational collaborative team. Do millennials, millennials need special attention to keep things inclusive? And Katrin, do you wanna have a go at that? Um, yeah, um, I'd love to. Um, first of all, I do not believe that we should tell anyone what they should do. <laughs> I, I am always of the opinion that uh, we should empower people so they are, uh, if I'm a leader, that people that the work around me, that they come 
come up with it and they do it the way they want to, they think it's the best and i i'm always in the favor of um, hiring you better than yourself uh, regardless of uh, age and, uh, and experience and everything um, or like area of experience um, so i i would not but it's it's certainly um, a challenge because if you expect that it will work and you say this is how we work in this company and there is a bit of i'm telling you and then you're executing it will not work mm. people will not stay i i'm not sure though if it's only millennials who have a problem with that i have a problem with it myself <laughs> also so yeah so maybe it's a good it's a good comment it's a good point um I, I, cause there are other questions. I'm going to open another question. I'd like to give one to Claudia and one to Andrew as well. The next one, um, the last question was from Megla. This one is from Katarina. And Katarina asks, I would love to know how, and if the concepts of new work, agile organizations and agile mindset, agile leadership and VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, are applied at your organizations in regards to attracting and retaining millennials. So Claudia or Andrew, which one of you would like to take that? I'm, I'm happy to jump because I have a short answer to that. So maybe then uh, Andrew can also jump on the same question. So I think uh, with what we've been living in the last year and a half, uh, companies are adapting and companies are now implementing um, these ways of working. So we are all learning how to do it. Uh, I think in large organizations, and when Andrew was saying, right, all the bureaucratic and everything in large organizations is a transformation. Uh, so we are going that direction because that's the direction talents are asking. Uh, so we are going that direction, but it's uh, yeah a transformation that will take a little bit of time. I think we are doing things fast, but uh, that's the direction companies will take. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Very, very uh, useful. Um, is it okay if I give you another question, Andrew, because we still do have one more. And um, Katerina also added great comment, Andrew, it's all about a generational workplace. No company can afford to only concentrate on millennials and, and young leaders. True diversity is about a truly generational workplace. Um, Megla has another question. Uh, but if it's okay, I'll go to Mohammed, and he, he asks also a nice question, which is on today's global business pressure, do you have the time to monitor the talent development program? Are you taking it just in time or it keeps on being postponed? And maybe that's a question to give to you, Andrew. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And, and I would say that when it comes to development, that the all generations in workplaces are looking for it. Um, as we've seen younger workers come in and they're like, I would like to be developed. And older workers are like, I never got that when I started here. And now mm. they're saying, I want to have that. I don't want to miss out on the opportunity. I don't want to be sidelined because of mics. I have experience, but I don't have knowledge. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is that, you know, depending on the business, it really does depend on how it's delivered. <clears throat> and I would say in startups, often it is just in time because with a startup business, you don't know what tomorrow might look like. You're building the train track as you go and you're like, oh, we now need this. Oh, we now need to know that. Oh, we now, now we've got a team. Oh, now we've got a person who has um, who's come to the office with um, from a different culture. Now we need to know cultural awareness from that. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, it is a mix of those things. But in generally, we're creating the business and developing people as we go. And that's where I think if you think about a, a startup, you have to not look too far. You can't say to a millennial, well, in three years time, I promise you'll get a promotion to the next level. No, you need to be able to say, welcome, we know that you've got talent, skills and abilities and strengths and we're going to help you, you know, build those strengths and train you in those skills today and tomorrow, not next year, not next month. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. I was recently working with a startup and it's so true how often you get that all wrong initially because you're really struggling to get the talent and struggling to build the culture and the values and so forth. And um, it takes a while to get the right balance. Yeah, you sort of, you mentioned it all right, that you're, you're a startup, you're scaling up, you have so many things that you need to consider with the investors and, and so forth. So it takes time to get that balance, but it's equity at the end of the day, it's fairness. It's, it's you know, making sure everyone is treated fairly. And if you're not, that is very demotivating. 
Um, Megla does have one more question. If you don't mind, Megla, I'm going to hold it till because I want to do one more last round with our speakers and throw another challenge to them. And if we have time, we'll do that last question from you, Megla. And the last question is actually to get you all to jump in. Um, and I, I have a question to you of what are you doing? to attract and retain young talent? What worked, what failed? What are your lessons learned? And I'd love it to just be maybe your top three bullet points and perhaps a story that you can share with us. So you can start in any order you'd like. Okay, I'll, I'll just start and continue with the same order. So okay. something that we are doing, uh, it's what you see behind me, right? We are getting, um, you know, externally recognized. So companies like the Great Place to Work Institute um, audit us, they ask our employees and they give these type of recognitions to us. So um, this is something that we're doing when it comes to our employer branding. However, I think what we are doing and is really working is we invest in our people. And when I say I, we invest in our people, we invest in all their um, you know, engagement, their development, their health and well-being. Um, so that's one of the key things. And another very important element just to do a top three is also we focus very much on diversity. We have a strong program which is called DHL for All, um, which shows, of course, that in the importance of diversity. And since we're talking generational and I saw a comment there, yes, the generational aspect is very, very important because I think the young generations can learn so much from others and vice versa. So those is what really is working for us. Um, Fari, because you said also what's not really working, I think it's about sometimes managing expectations. We get a lot of young leaders coming to the company, sometimes through internships or apprentices, and sometimes we cannot fulfill the, the yeah, giving them a fixed job. And sometimes they, we have to lose those talents, but that's a bit out of our control. So sometimes it's these expectations that they come and they want to stay, but you cannot always offer them a permanent job. Yeah. And and I'm I'm, you know, it was interesting. It just reminded me of something Anne Katrine said about young talent coming in and looking at a leader and saying, Oh, I want your job and I'll get that in two years. And that's all about those expectations because you probably can, but you know, you probably have the skills and you, you the knowledge, you know, the, the, the ambition to get there, but it takes a lot longer to get there. And, and I think with the young leaders, patience is, is, is short. Yes. So that is quite one of the challenges as well. Thank you for that, Claudia. So who'd like to go next? Let's keep the order. <laughs> <laughs> We want structure. Yeah, no, I can, I can continue. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I realized I probably have mentioned everything I wanted to say here at the end, but I, I, I picked, uh, I, actually, I would like to share more what I have personally experienced that, that ha has worked very well. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it always worked ve very well across the, the company where I have worked. But to have skilled recruiters, whatever you call them, like whatever title you have to them. Uh, but that makes a huge difference. Uh, if you can really find the, 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 the kind of the right people, it's how you talk to people, how you engage, how you make them excited, um, how you drive the whole recruiting process where you have to be, uh, in my opinion, very, very fast uh, to, to be able to secure uh, the, the ones you want. So that's one thing. Um, another aspect uh, that I um, have realized it's extremely important uh, is around flexible, how should I say, flexible benefits or flexible arrangement. If we could really target what, what that person needs. Is it a flexible work location? Is it flexible working hours? Uh, is it um, the possibility to have a sabbatical? Although it's like, okay, what's your problem? You've been two years in this role. How, how, what's, uh, what, what do you need a break for? But to offer that and boost the motivation uh, for people then to stay. Yeah. What is not working very well, uh, I think, is the work-life balance. And it might be across the generations, but in my experience, it's over proportionally amongst the millennials. I think the advantage they have of being um, very connected and being very on and using technology to mix work and life, it also means that it's always, it always mixed. And 
sometimes it's difficult maybe also to know where are my boundaries and i love to have millennials uh, working in my team i can go any time of the day as i and just like okay i need this and they will jump and they will do it and they will do it well but it's high uh, input and high output yeah. and that is burning the candle a little bit in both, both edges so that uh, and so that that is definitely something that is um alarming and and and, and difficult to manage uh, I, I find myself uh, also to find because unconsciously I, I might also as an employer or as a leader misuse it because it's so convenient <laughs> But coming coming back again, I have beliefs in the next generation because that next generation wants to have a life, um, a work life cut, and want do not want to be disturbed during free time uh, from work, and will use technology to make sure it's nothing happened, it's not happening. Mm. Uh, and then I've, uh, just an, a, a last uh, point as well that uh, about this across generations, I think we have a. Um, uh, unutilized uh, talent pool when it comes uh, many companies uh, also have a diversity agenda and uh, have issues maybe also um, especially not only but especially with the women in leadership roles regardless of uh, age but because of the gender um, older uh, <laughs> older women um, could probably navigate some of this also very well uh, and, uh, and and doesn't have maybe all of the things around. So I think to have a more diverse um, generational spread uh, in the workplace uh, will also have help um, kind of manage manage those uh, those challenges as well. Yeah, great great points, Anne Katrin. I mean, and I mean the flexible working environment. I think has also been. Um, heightened by, of course, the pandemic. We, we've learned such lessons through that, that we can survive with, with working with flexible and hybrid work and so forth. I remember one, one of our guests on VGL was actually a, a startup company who only worked virtually. They, they had, I think, I don't know, 70 employees and none of them were in the same country, city and so forth. And, and so when we asked him, what's the hybrid work, new work, way of work going to look like? He said, but we've always been doing that. So it's it's for some companies they have they have adapted they, they their model has been based on that but for us who were more used to the face to face it has been some adapting and we realize we can do it you know we can work hybrid we can uh, travel less um, and have more flexible work and and the other thing I I really appreciate that you talked about work life balance and how millennials are maybe burning that candle at both ends because it does raise that whole issue about looking after ourselves and taking our mental health issues in seriously. And I think, you know, it, it's a good question because I think millennials realize that probably more than others. Uh, and they, they are, um, they're acknowledging that too. So jumping to Andrew, uh, some people are leaving, but the ones who are still here, we're, we're still here and we have a Slido and we have Andrew and we're ah, wrapping it all up pretty soon. Andrew, your, your top three points, what are you doing to attract and retain talent, success stories and failures? We are looking at um, building on strengths. We are looking at strengths, not looking, you know, you need skills to do a job. But the strengths is what going to carry you through the good days, the bad days. It's going to help you overcome challenges and obstacles. And if we focus on strengths, people are going to be passionate and engaged and want to participate. So do very much that. The other thing is about creating a clear culture, management culture, and just general staff culture, being really sure about we know who we are. Yeah. So we know what to expect from each other, how we can perform together, work together. So that's another thing we're really being clear on. And the other thing is this flexible work life. Um, you know, we're a, we're now in four countries with our offices and looking to do more, which means we're now across different time zones. So we all can't do, you know, nine to five in Copenhagen, but being flexible to work from home, work from anywhere, because when you do that well, you can actually boost productivity because people feel like I'm more engaged, I'm more okay, because I can do it from, you know, my family's gathering this weekend for a big special event. I can be there a few days beforehand and still work but be fresh and be a part of that because we're recognizing that we're actually hiring humans, not machines, and we need to take care of them in through that flexible working environment. Yeah, wonderfully said. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> Very lovely. Um, and everyone, thank you for Claudia and Anne katrin and Andrew to jump on this question and answer it in this style. There, 
we have just a few minutes. If it's okay, I will take that last question from Megla, which was a question for any of you. It's research has shown that millennials prefer less authoritative leadership and desire a mentor so that they learn the purpose of a task. What, what do you think? What do you agree? Yeah, I fully agree. And I think those are the leaders uh, that helped me especially stay and continue developing uh, in my company. So I, I fully agree with the statement. And I think that's the type of uh, leaders, uh, companies, and that's the type of yeah leadership culture companies need uh, to attract and retain um, uh, yeah the new generations. Uh, in general, I guess everybody, but the new generations especially. Yeah, thank you. And Katrina, Andrew, do you want to say anything to that? I, I would uh, agree as well. I think, though, that it's beyond generations when it comes to uh, do you like to be told or not. Uh, I think to have that uh, autonomy is something in, in human nature. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if they want a mentor, certainly a promoter. Uh, mm. Mentor, I'm, I'm not, in, I've, I've seen different, uh, different scenarios on that one. OK. Thank you. Andrew, do you have a... I once had a manager drive me to a job interview, not inside the company, a whole other company. And it was the best thing because as Anne Katrin just said, he was a promoter of me. He was like, I want to help you. I think you're great. Let me push you into the next thing. And because often we can't see the, the gold in ourselves, we need those around us to see it and help us see it. So I, I do agree. You've got to have someone who is on your side driving you forward. And thank you. And you know, I'm reading the chats and, and people are leaving. But before you leave, we have a Slido for you because we need you to say to tell us some feedback. So maybe Khadija, are we able to share that Slido with people? And if you can go to Slido, we have uh, the link is here in the chat box. The question is, how will you after today's session, how will you inspire young leaders? And it would be great for people who are here to just share what you would do differently. We'll take a screenshot of that and share that with you later. Walk the talk, mentor, empowering, empowering the team, empowering them. Listen closely, promote, have empathy. Build curiosity, give them a voice. Show how they can grow. Yeah, very, very true. More flexibility. Vegan food. <laughs> I love it, vegan food. Andrew, did you write that? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, being good examples, building connections, promoting strengths, being authentic. Fantastic. Really, really nice. Uh, very nice. Listening having fun, believe in them, wonderful. And, and this sort of stands out, empowering them and promoting, uh, promote them stands out. Uh, just before we close, um, I'd just like to share some things with you. Uh, we have um, our next Vienna Global Leaders will be coming up on the 10th of November. And our last session of 2021 will be on um, Leaders in Transition. We also have information that we will send out to you, uh, some programs on um, supporting leaders through their journeys of uh, first time managers and also leadership development. And that will come to you in an email plus the favorite songs of Claudia and Katrin and Andrew. So they gave us their motivational songs. And we started, of course, if you were here at the beginning of uh, when we opened VGL, it was nine to five remix. So each of them have shared a song and also one of their most inspiring books with us. And so we'll share all of that with you uh, in an email and a very, very big thank you um, to, especially to Claudia, to Anne Katrin, to Andrew for sharing your insights, for being so gener generous and giving your time to us and, and all this valuable content. I'd love Claudia and Anne Katrin and Andrew to say something to close. So your final words, we leave with that. I'll just 
a big, big thank you from my side and, you know, for everybody that is here, you know, let's keep supporting our young generations in whatever position you are um, in your, um, yeah, companies and your workplaces. Thank you, Claudia. And Katrin, since we're going to stay to the structure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you all for uh, being so um, engaged in this conversation. It's been a, been a pleasure to be part of it. And we might have uh, put a bit like a narrow focus on millennials. Uh, we certainly think about uh, the whole workforce. And and I would like to just uh, follow what what you said, Andrew, as well. We, it, it's human beings, uh, a person. So that's how we want to treat people. So just continue to do that and just pay attention to the people around you. Absolutely. Thank you, Anne Katrin. Andrew. So my, I have two, yeah, I'm going to be sneaking and put two in there, but I, I believe everybody has a next step, no matter how long they've been in the organization, uh, no matter their age or age bracket, they have a next step and we need to help them find that next step and take them there. And my thing was to say that in all of this, we need to remember to take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you. Those were such powerful closing words. We couldn't have done it better. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Appreciate your time and these great insights. Thank you again, Claudia, Katrin, and Andrew. And thank you, everyone. Bye.